Owen, we're live. Sergeants, can we start our recordings, please? Cloud recording is up. Uh, Sergeants, can we start our recording? The backup is rolling. Sergeant Martinez, can you give us the opening, please? Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Aging. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Okay. Good morning. I'm Councilmember Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. I would like to thank all of you for joining us on primary day, I hope you have voted. If not, please get out to vote. For this important oversight hearing on serving seniors in senior residents and communities during the pandemic. It's important to assess the things the city has effectively done to serve our city seniors during this time. And also to look at the ways in which the city has failed this population. I have start, stated in many, many hearings, emphasizing that the older adult population is the fastest growing group in the state. And I'm gonna do so again today. Let me repeat, older adults are the fastest growing group, not only in New York City, but in the entire state. Over the last 10 years, the older adult population in New York State has grown by 26% to 3.2 million. A third of that population lives in New York City. New York City is home to approximately 1.2 million adults who are 65 and older. And that number is growing rapidly across all five boroughs. New York City is aging. So when we think about the services that the city needs to provide New Yorkers, it is extremely important that we identify and respond to the unique needs of seniors. For example, seniors tend to have a higher risk of social isolation and mental health challenges. They, fa they face limitation in daily activities unique health needs <clears throat> and specific economic challenges. Older adults are often responsible for taking care of grandchildren under the age of 18 and providing caregiving to loved ones or friends who have long-term illness or disability. They are more likely to have chronic disease such as diabetes, heart disease, and high blood pressure and face high rates of food insecurity. This means that as a city population ages, the city needs to fund and create new services and resources that take into consideration these factors. During the pandemic, the city, the Department for the Aging and the city's senior services provider have felt the consequences of not thoroughly preparing for the realities of an aging New York. It's true that DIFTA has provided critical services to our seniors during the pandemic. DIFTA has helped senior access food through its former DIFTA direct home deliver meal program, has helped coordinate moving its programming and friendly visiting services from in-person to online, and has worked with NYCHA to distribute 10,000 tablets to NYCHA seniors and has worked with a variety of senior agencies, city agencies and organizations 
to connect seniors to vaccination appointments. However, while DIFTA has done its best to provide these services to seniors during the pandemic, it is the senior services providers who have filled in the gap in services. It is our senior service providers who have helped seniors eat by providing nutritious, reliable home delivered meals. It is the provider who have helped seniors keep informed by communicating information about the pandemic and vaccine and city services. And it is our providers who have helped seniors combat social isolation and boredom by providing online programming and socialization activity after the physical closure of our senior centers. Our senior services provider are our heroes and DIFTA has often made it difficult for them to do their job. DIFTA has faced criticism for lack of communication and lack of transparency in announcing and, challenge, and changing their plans. It has been unclear about funding for basic needs such as PPE reimbursement and the entire RFP process has been prolonged, confusing mess. The agency has also faced criticism for DIFTA's direct, which often deliver food, poor meals, or did not deliver meals at all. And for the Get Cool New York City program, which was meant to deliver air conditioning to low-income seniors last summer, and instead left many seniors stuck indoors in the heat without air conditioning units at all. It is further unclear how DIFTA has reached out to seniors not officially connected to the system over the past year and what changes, if any, the agency has made to serve seniors in future emergency situations. Today, the committee wants to hear about it all. We want to hear about the full scope of what DIFTA has provided to seniors, especially those in senior residents and senior communities during the pandemic. What challenges it faced, what its success have been, and what failure this agency has identified. We want to know what lesson DIFTA has taken away from the last year and what policy changes or new initiatives have resulted from those lessons. We also wanna learn from our and senior center providers, what did the city get right during the pandemic and what did it get very wrong? What unique frustrations and struggle did our seniors and providers face during this time? and what changes need to be made so that if we ever, ever face a crisis like this again, we will be ready to serve our seniors. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing. Our counsel, Nusa Chadari, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Dohini Sapora. I also like to thank my deputy chief of staff, Connor Irvin, and I wanted to uh, thank our committee member who have joined us today, Council Member Diaz Sr. Welcome. And uh, I'll turn it back to the, our committee council. And thank you to all the sergeants for helping out today. Thank you, Chair. I am Nuzat Chowdhury, Counsel to the Aging Committee of the New York City Council. I will be moderating today's hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin testimony, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify. After you are called on, you will be unmuted by the host. Um, I will be calling uh, your name, so please listen for your name. After you are called on, you will be unmuted. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. This includes both questions and answers. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. 
All public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name again, please wait a brief minute for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. I will now call on the following members of the administration to testify. Jocelyn Grodin, Associate Commissioner for Social Services and Direct Services from the Department for the Aging, and Sarah Sanchala, Director of Government Affairs. I will read the oath and after, I will call on each of you to individually respond. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Associate Commissioner Grodin? I do, yes. Sarah Sanchala? I do. Thank you. Associate Commissioner, you may begin when ready. Good morning, Chair Chen and members of the Aging Committee. I am Jocelyn Grodin, Associate Commissioner for the Bureau of Social Services, Direct Services, and Elder Justice at the New York City Department for the Aging, DEPTA. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss our older adult services, how we've pivoted and adapted to COVID, and, and the wonderful work we've done to support older adults during this difficult time. A, a special shout out to Primary Day and um, hope everyone has the chance, if you have not already done so, to get out the vote. DIFTA offers a wide range of services to older adults to meet the varied needs of people over 60. As the council, as the chairwoman um, spoke about, there are such a range of needs and supports that DIFTA provides. I'm very proud of the work that the DIFTA has done during this time and in general. This, our services have remained available and open to all New Yorkers during the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the last year, DIFTA and our providers have transitioned programs and services as needed to respond to the public health needs of older adults, including moving to virtual and telephone-based engagement. These services include, but are certainly not limited to, friendly visiting, geriatric mental health, caregiver support, case management, home care, the Elderly Crime Victim Resource Center, the Grandparent Resource Center, our Health Insurance Information Center, and the development of new programming, such as our Fraud Prevention and Empowerment Series that was initiated through our Elder Justice Group and our new Friendly Voices Program, a model which strives to combat social isolation. Directly and through our robust and critical provider network, we support clients in accessing resources and navigating complicated systems, such as scree applications, applications to senior housing, help identifying housing resources and other needed services that support older adults to remain safely and fully in the community. Last year during the pandemic, DIFTA worked with the New York City Housing Authority, NYCHA, to deliver 10,000 tablets to households with people aged 60 and older who did not have devices and included a year of free Wi-Fi training and help desk support. Through our contract with Older Adult Technology Services, often called OATS, training and technical assistance support have been provided to older adults on how to use devices and to answer user specific questions as they arise. The Wi Fi and technical support has now been extended for an additional year to allow older New Yorkers living in NYCHA to keep ongoing communication, connection, and access to virtual programming during the pandemic. DIFTA has many partnerships to preserve housing for older adults, a need that we know is critical to all New Yorkers. One of those programs that's unique to DIFTA is the home sharing program. We have had a partnership with New York Foundation for Senior Citizens for many years. And through this innovative program, a host with an extra room can be matched with a guest who's seeking housing. At least one of the participants must be 60 and older, and the other um, is open for those that, that meet that matched criteria. 
Additionally, for older tenants facing eviction and um, housing emergencies, they may be able to receive free legal and social services support through DIFTA's assigned council project, an important program in which DIFTA has partnered with the Civil, Civil Court of New York City to link and support older adults with legal services, programs, and supports they need to maintain their housing. So, and other supports um, that we provide to help older adults remain active, vital, and safe in their community include programs such as our senior employment programs, home care to help clients with managed personal care and housekeeping, classes and recreation that maintain connection, creativity, intellectual engagement, and, and connection to basic needs like food, as well as opportunities to participate in volunteer opportunities, including our intergenerational programs such as foster grandparent program. Councilwoman Chen mentioned mental health, something that is so important to us. Um, and we realized how, um, how important this need has come to the surface during the pandemic. This pandemic has been a strain on every single one of us, especially mm -hmm. older adults have been some of the most vulnerable, isolated, impacted by the need to stay home, impacted by ex profound experiences of grief and loss, disconnection from their routines and face-to-face -face engagement. Since the pandemic, we've increased supports to address the pandemic of social isolation. In March, 2020, we launched our wellness calls to older adults and to date have conducted more than 4.5 million calls with over 200,000 unique individuals. These calls continue to serve an essential purpose, not only to engage and foster a connection with the older adult who might be experiencing social isolation, but to check in on how they're doing and what they need and to, and to form linkages to critical resources like food friendly visiting, elder abuse programs, mental health supports, and more. In addition to DIFTA's geriatric mental health programs that support clients who are struggling with mental health needs, such as depression, anxiety, friendly visiting also serves as a mental health intervention to combat social isolation. It focuses largely on isolated, often homebound older adults who are connected with DIFTA's case management programs. The program matches older adults who are experiencing the damaging effects of social isolation with well-trained matched volunteers who spend time with them to provide meaningful social interaction around shared hobbies and interests. The program expands the older adults' connection to their community and helps them prevent the, the isolated and helps prevent further social isolation, which can lead to things like depression and loneliness. During the last year, these visits have continued and continue to operate virtually and telephonically to respond to the public health needs of older adults. We have some wonderful outcome data that shows the significant impact on both client and volunteer in terms of demonstrated reductions in feelings of isolation and loneliness. To expand support and address the social isolation and loneliness of a broader range of older adults who might not be homebound, DIFTA during the pandemic launched a new iteration of this program called Friendly Voices, which was implemented in October, 2020. This program was established to transcend and open eligibility to a wider range of older adults and will remain virtual rather than the traditional friendly visiting that was attached to CMA um, case management. This program is much more expansive and open and offers older adults the opportunity to be matched with a volunteer, a peer or a small group to join together around conversation, 
connection and shared hobbies and interests. The Voices program currently has openings and we welcome older adults and volunteers to join. If you are interested, please call Age and Connect, which if you don't know the number is 212-244-6469. Home Delivered Meals. Our Home Delivered Meals program is another vital component of DIFTA's network of core services. Not only do Home Delivered Meals provide basic sustenance to homebound older adults across the five boroughs, the interaction with the delivery person, which for many clients may be the only human interaction during the day, provides another level of support to combat social isolation, foster connection, and connect the client. The number of meals delivered to homebound older adults increased 5% between fiscal year 19 and 20, and in 2020, a total of 4,950,426 meals were delivered by our incredible providers. Naturally occurring retirement communities. We also understand that many older adults are now living in natural occurring retirement communities, often called NORCs. NORCs are unique in that they allow residents to access health and social services where they live. Services include health and wellness, fitness classes, case management, help accessing native benefits and entitlements, education activities, interesting outings, volunteer opportunities. Across the city, DIFTA funds services for 28 NORCs and there are additional 32 NORCs that receive funding directly by the state or through discretionary funding through council members like you. 11 NORCs are located in NYCHA developments. We are very excited about our RFP which recently closed and the amount of interest expressed in providing older New Yorkers with the services they need. Due to procurement rules, while we can't get into the details, we are very excited to see so much interest in, in an application for our RFP. And we will know more in the fall once applications are reviewed and awards are announced. Throughout the pandemic, DIFTA contracted NORCs, like all of our providers, engaged with residents virtually and telephonically, responding to the public health needs while maintaining that vital connection. Some examples of programs that DIFTA funded NORCs included during the pandemic include exercise classes, nutrition and health webinars, concerts, and book clubs that took place in several different languages. Senior centers. We are thrilled that older adult centers now, as of June 14th, just a few short days ago, were, are able to open as soon as they're ready for in-person engagement. We know the significant benefits of congregate gatherings and look forward to our network being fully operational in the near future. During the pandemic, older adult centers, many of which offered virtual programming, pivoted so quickly in response to the needs of the pandemic. For context, prior to the pandemic, 47 senior centers and sites affiliated were providing virtual programming. That number as of April, 2021 has grown to 273. With, with centers and their affiliated sites providing over 117,000 virtual sessions, including fitness activities, arts and craft, music, socialization, and, and other fun and interesting activities over platforms like Zoom and, and similar models. As a result, older adults now have a wide range of options and fewer barriers than ever to participation. Centers are providing virtual programming in over a dozen languages. Virtual programming is one example of adapting to the changing needs of older adults. 
We have learned the profound benefits of this option and look forward to continuing increased virtual programming, even as our older adult centers open. As we prepare for the summer, the New York City Office of Emergency Management, NISM, has also prepped their network of cooling centers for days of extreme heat. Over 100 DIFTA senior centers have opted in to service cooling centers through their program, of which 70, um, as of right now, are fully approved and ready to operate. Vaccination. As of June 20th, 73.6% of adults 65 and older in New York City have received at least one dose of the vaccine. That's over 940,000 seniors. As COVID-19 vaccines rolled out, our network, DIFTA, with its providers, mobilized to ensure that older adults had accurate information about the safety and efficacy of the vaccine and were able to access vaccines as easily as possible. Providers and DIFTA staff across programs engage with older adults to ensure that they knew about the vaccines and were needed, got help scheduling appointments or arranging transportation. Temporary on-site clinics were opened in NYCHA senior and community centers and North buildings. In addition, as part of the task force on racial inclusion and equity, community-based organization initiative, 30 of DIFTA's case management and caregiver providers contacted their client and signed them up for vaccine appointments. When in-home vaccinations started in March, DIFTA called all fully homebound clients to assist them with screening and facilitate appointments for those who are interested. The in-home program is currently available to New Yorkers who are fully homebound, 75 years and older, with a disability, a nature resident, and others based on employment status. We have also been partnering with senior centers to have vaccine vans outside on location. Last week, mobile vans were deployed at Washington Heights Community Service and Carter Burden. And this week, um, they will be at the Jewish Community Council of Greater Coney Island, Central Harlem Senior Citizen Center, and Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York. The city is continuing its efforts to meet New Yorkers where they are in its robust mobile vaccination program. It has never been easier to get a COVID-19 vaccine in New York City. And we are very happy with the progress the city has made in terms of access, vaccine appointments, and we will continue to work with the BCC and our partners to focus on ensuring that every person who is ready and interested in getting a vaccination will have that access. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged us to do more under conditions that we could have never expected. The pandemic has reinforced how resilient older adults are and underscored the critical importance of community care. We're so proud of the work we've done in partnership with our providers and how they have adapted and responded to the needs of older adults. We look forward to continuing to grow supports and continue to evolve our work. As always, we are very grateful to the chair and the committee for your advocacy and continued partnership and support of older New Yorkers. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify. Thank you. We will now turn to Chair Chen for questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Associate Commissioner. Thank you for your testimony. We also have been joined by Council Member Brooks Powers. Welcome. Uh, I know from your testimony, I mean, quite a lot has happened uh, over the last year. And I know that you know, everyone, you know, from DIFTA staff and the commissioner and all of you 
and the provider has done tremendous work uh, for our older adult uh, population. I'm going to just start with a couple of questions. Just when you mentioned the RFP, I know that you cannot go into detail, but can you just tell us how many RFP application uh, did you receive? Uh, and like for the older adult center and for NOC, can you give us that number? Unfortunately, while the procurement is still open, we cannot share that information, but I will say that we are thrilled by the very enthusiastic response to the RFP. And we look forward to reviewing applications and releasing more specific details as soon as possible. Okay, I'm, look for, I'm looking forward to, um, to that conversation uh, because I know that I've heard from the commissioner that we have uh, a lot of new applicants and, and much more applications. So uh, I'm looking forward to that. But just to add to that, the amount of funding is not enough, but we'll get to that. <laughs> uh, you were talking about an extensive, uh, extensive list of all the services and new services that DIFTA has provided during the pandemic. Um, and with what agency um, did you partner with and can you tell us like some of those services that you talk about, like friendly voices, and which one are temporary and which one will be become permanent? Thank you so much for that question. Um, so in terms of partnership, we work so closely with our sister agencies. And from the beginning of the pandemic, it really was um, a very coordinated approach in terms of our work with PEU. NYCHA, certainly we work very closely with NYPD, HPD, um, Oath. Uh, we, you know, we continue to forge more and more partnerships and connections in terms of working together as one city to best support the needs of older adults. And uh, we appreciate that it takes us coming together with our unique um, specializations and services to, to really um, provide the maximum level of service and support to older adults. Um, new programs that we've initiated during COVID-19. So the first thing, or one of the first things we rolled out in addition to the food program would be the wellness calls. So, you know, we're, it, it, we're very much adapting as we have been throughout the pandemic to the needs of older adults and what resonates for them. So. Um, for example, we've recently seen with the uh, opening of services, uh, a downtick of the number of weekly wellness calls. So that's something we're going to assess as we go and see where it fits in and, and what's supportive um, to older adults as, as the system adapts, as they adapt. Um, things that we um, are absolutely looking to keep in place, one of them would be friendly voices. Um, we think it's so exciting that we've transcended the eligibility of friendly visiting, which has been around and connected to our case management programs for many years. And this really allows more people to come in and be a part of this program that we know has, has meaning, has clear outcomes. Um, we've also applied a, a different lens to the program, looking at not only the traditional model, which I think you're familiar with, which is the volunteer and the older adult who are matched around um, often shared interests, um, to a peer-to-peer -peer model, and also looking at forming um, online groups, which older adults could help lead and foster contribution, so that's something we're excited about and we want to continue to um, keep and evolve. Um, another new program that we're really excited about is the Chat with the Experts series. Um, we've been thinking and um, working a lot to evolve our elder justice work. Um, you know, obviously elder abuse is something we've been super concerned about always and particularly during the pandemic where we don't have you know, the same level of eyes on people. Um, so this is a great opportunity to talk to older adults, get them information about um, different financial benefits and opportunity, as well as the rise of these awful frauds and scams that are out there and connect them to information, whether it's health insurance, whether it's Medicaid to really learn more and to feel um, knowledgeable and empowered. So this is a series that we've seen a lot of success 
um, that we want to keep building upon. And then an, another thing, which has been a huge um, lesson learned, I, th I think for all of us, is this virtual space. And um, what we can do with that, um, you know, what, what a Zoom can offer. So even at, as incredibly excited as we are that the centers are moving uh, and reopening and that we can have the face-to-face, -face, which, which is so um, essential. We also see whether it's intermittent illness, um, uh, terrible weather, um, you just don't want to leave the house today, that the virtual programming should really prevail and continue to evolve. Um, and we should use this opportunity to really break down the digital divide, which has existed way too long. And, and I think we've made really significant inroads and, and hope to continue to do more. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think on your the wellness call, um, I mean, it's a huge number of calls um, that were made that you ta uh, talked about in your testimony. Can you tell me like, who were the one that's making these wellness calls? And then also what is the content? Like what, what did they talk about um, in this wellness call? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so the vast majority of calls are made by our providers, um, most notably the older adult centers who have the, the largest number of sites, the largest number of clients. Um, as well as our case management, or all, all of the providers. And um, we also have a number of directly operated programs through the Department for the Aging. So I would say everybody who's a caseworker who is working with clients um, before the pandemic and when we were not able to convene in person, really adapted to a telephone or virtual based model. Um, early on in the pandemic, the focus was really around connecting with clients around basic needs, food insecurity, mm -hmm. safety issues, um, you know, functional issues, um, so that we could um, hear, hear what was needed and connect um, older adults with vital and essential resources. N now that it's been over a year, um, those calls have, have really iterated and taken on um, their own sort of flavor, depending on the needs of the client, how often she wants to engage, what she wants to talk about. Um, so I, I would say they've really, the, while they're rooted in that sort of basic assessment and triage, um, they've really expanded to something much bigger, broader, client-centered. Okay, yeah, because I heard that also DIFTA staff was also helping to make make those wellness call in the beginning. I remember um, hearing that from the uh, commissioner. Um, right, do that's you... right, and they still do. You know, we have, a, I'm, I'm sorry, we have a, a, you know, we have a senior employment, a foster grandparent, the grandparent resource center, our elder abuse group. We have a number of groups that work directly with clients who, who continue to maintain that connection. So has SIFTA tracked the number of seniors served in over, uh, in the past year? Uh, in terms of number of senior participating in virtual programming. And, and out of that, like, do you track like how many uh, of those seniors are new to the DIFTA system? We have over the pandemic seen an increase in clients that are engaged with our system. Um, the number increased, um, I believe is um, about 13,000. Um, who have been engaging in a variety of different spaces. It's been really interesting to see how, how more people have showed up um, as a result of our outreach. And I think our connection with our city and partners and, and so on, um, and have been engaged in um, DIFTA services. I, yeah, and, and just to confirm the number is 13,000. Um, which is, um, and, and while we don't have the final data right now, we expect the total clients served in fiscal year 21 will be roughly 95% of fiscal year 19. So we are seeing it, it's a, a little bit of, um, you know, a, a curve in terms of the increase during the pandemic. And now we have seen um, some decrease in demand. Um, and I don't have the data right in front of me, but I, I do suspect that we brought a lot of new people in through our partnerships, through um, the increased diversity and creativity of our services, and we'll continue to do so. 
So the 13,000 that you talked about are the new people that participated in your virtual programming? So the 13,000 is a spike that we saw during oh, fiscal sorry. year 20. Overall, okay. system-wide. Okay. Um, the, other, the other increase is that we also saw that in, in the many of the, uh, the Get Food program recipients uh, connected through, you know, um, senior residents and then more than three, 33,000 individuals over the age of uh, 60 are still receiving the meals as of May 2021. How is the Department of Aging planning to serve these individuals? and ensure that their needs are met when the Get Food program um, inevitable will wind down. Right, thank do you. you know, do you know when the Get Food program is gonna end? I, I don't, I, I would defer that to the Get Food program. Um, we continue to work very closely with Get Food for any demands um, that exceed our current services as they relate to food. We understand that Get Food continues to work very closely with the city to identify the possibility, the possibility of sustained unmet food needs, and we remain in close contact with them. So when they do start to transition off the program, we'll be working um, in close coordination with them. I mean, your testimony, you're talking about the home deliver meal program, um, you know, increase. Are we anticipating additional funding? Um, to accommodate the additional capacity of the home deliver meal program. Thank you. Because that's a, uh, I mean, that's a, a great program that the city has been operating, and I know that during the pandemic, um, you know, the DIFTA did not want to sort of like mess with that program. I mean, they don't want to. Right. So we did not. A lot, of the, a lot of seniors got track into the, the get food program, which in the beginning, there were a lot of issues and problem, you know, food was not great and, and there was a lot of complaints. And so we wanted to make sure that a program that is running well, uh, that we have sufficient funding so that it can increase capacity because now you have connected all these seniors during the pandemic. Now they know about the system. They know about uh, what the city has to offer. And so how do we make sure that we have the funding um, in order to meet the capacity? Definitely agree. Um, HDM is a great program. We served over 22,000 clients from July to March through Home Deliver Meals. We are happy to report that $41.8 million is in the executive budget for Home Deliver Meals. The executive budget allocation covers roughly 4.5 million meals that will be delivered to homebound seniors over the next fiscal year. Given that the pandemic created unprecedented demand for home delivered meals, we anticipate that during the coming year, our services will level back to pre-pandemic usage as things gradually open up throughout the city. We prioritize the safety and the needs of New Yorkers above all else. And as such, we are continually evaluating the situation with our partners to make sure we meet the needs of older adults. I'd like to add that we're happy to see that we have continued to see a level, leveling off of demand for services like home delivered meals, which, which spiked uh, rather fantastically early in the pandemic. And um, with the reopening of senior centers, the resumption of grab and go and congregate meals, um, the additional access to um, those more traditional means of accessing food has been established, been reestablished. And um, we'll continue to work with Get Food in the city um, to address any gaps. Um, of course, the situation is fluid and we are um, assessing, but we're definitely seeing again that, that curve where there really was a spike and, and now um, it's been declining. 
Okay, it might, I mean, it might not. I mean, you have all these seniors that were connected to the Get Food program and now we're phasing out Get Food, we gotta make sure that they're taken care of. And also in the council, we're still asking for um, over $16 million just to even get the cost of the, uh, the meal to be on par with the national average. Uh, so there's still a need for funding on that. Um, the other issue we, we talked about much earlier was uh, you also mentioned about the mental health needs during the pandemic. Uh, the DIFTA work, um, how has it worked with Thrive uh, NYC and what services? I mean, you talk about some services that was uh, provided through the pandemic is through your wellness calls. And um, so how do we um, figure a way to really expand the services? Um, I know that we don't have um, mental health services or geriatric mental health services in every older adult centers. And the mayor is talking about social worker uh, in every school and we should have social worker that can help senior with mental health issue in every center in every Newark. Um, so how have uh, DIFTA worked with uh, Thrive in terms of getting funding and getting support? We work very closely with the Mayor's Office of Community Mental Health, formerly known as Thrive. Um, they um, really were key to initiating our geriatric mental health programs a number of years ago, um, something at the time that was so sorely needed and long overdue. So they've really um, been incredible partners. Um, we also, they also support us in our friendly visiting program including um, you know, helping us look at and move the data to, to get meaningful outcomes for clients and the volunteers. We, um, I, I, something I, I failed to mention earlier, we also worked with them to initiate the RISE program, which is um, something sort of in between the wellness calls and geriatric mental health, which are really supportive um, calls for clients, reassurance calls um, that provide a soft touch mental health for, par for clients that are not experiencing acute mental health issues. Um, we were in frequent conversations with Thrive and, um, and our city partners to continue to work together to evolve and expand these services, something um, that's really important to, to both groups. Um, I guess back to the, the home delivered meal. Um, I mean, do you have a plan in place in terms of how to um, accommodate, you know, how to help support the increase in capacity if that happens? Uh, and I know that, you know, during the, the pandemic, one of the first thing that uh, you know, after the, the, the grab and go was even talking to provider was some providers who have been um, providing the home delivered meal to their client. And they said that they could do it with support, but they weren't getting the support. Like if you need more people to do the delivery, I mean, the city's hiring, you know, these delivery app people to deliver the get food program, but the senior centers weren't getting uh, that support to help them. So right after, you know, we did grab and go for a little bit and then was like, they got, providers got totally shut down and try, and then got everything got moved to get food without giving the, our provider the opportunity, the support that they need to continue to serve uh, their clients. Cause that's what I'm hearing out there from providers and from seniors who are not thrilled about what they were getting from the get food program and they miss you know, what they're getting from their senior center, which is meals that are more nutritious and things that they are they are, are used to. So I think that it's difficult to sort of have a plan in place that to accommodate uh, the increases. I said earlier in my opening, our older adult population is increasing every day. It's that the need is gonna be there. Uh, and how is the city, you know, preparing for it? Because a home delivered meal is not just a home delivered meal. I mean, the person who delivered the meal also um, contacted uh, the seniors, see how they're doing, and, and it's, that, it's that human contact 
uh, that is included in there. And, you know, and we are partnering with you to advocate uh, for more resources, because this is something that we need to, to, to really, you know, plan on and, and make sure that we have enough resources to meet that need. And that's the same thing with case management and, and with home care services. We don't want to have waiting lists. Uh, and as more people find out about our services, the services, I mean, I want to, one of the personal experience I have in my district is that people didn't know about the home care services that DIFTA provide, the ISIP program. And when they found out about it, I mean, they were thrilled and they were like so appreciative. And there's going to be more and more seniors like that who do not meet um, the Medicaid guideline, cannot get home care services because they're not that low income. But they work hard all their lives and now they don't qualify, but they need help. And the ISA program, the city's home care program, really, it's a great program that gives them that relief. And more and more people are going to find out about it. So we got to make sure that we, we don't have uh, a waiting list and, and, a, and have a, a, a plan for that. So, um, <laughs> so you said a lot. And so first, I want to say we're so proud of the meals that our older adult centers provide and really want to underline what you said about the role of the driver, which, which is so significant, not only in terms of delivering food, but in terms of providing social connection and providing a set of eyes on somebody who might need help. So all really important. Um, in terms of your question about HDM, um, again, recognizing it's fluid. There are a lot of things happening at once. The city's reopening, the centers are reopening. We're seeing congregate meals um, come back as well as grab and go. So, th so there are a lot of different things happening. I, I, Associate Commissioner, I just wanted yeah. to go back. Like the DIFTA, you know, I think there was a lot of frustration in the beginning. And I, I sensed it when I, you know, spoke with the commissioner is that right now, you know, you're looking back. If DIFTA, like, did you do some evaluation, like with what happened, you know, during the pandemic, that what resources would have made a difference, right? If you could, you know, like assess like what, what happened, like would it have made a difference if DIFTA, you know, had the resources in the beginning to continue to do what you were doing in the early part, you know, with the grab and go, with uh, the food direct program. But I mean, my feeling is that maybe DIFTA didn't get the support and that's why it was like centralized and all of a sudden everything was pushed to the get food program. But now that you're looking, you know, evaluating what happened, did you, did you look, did DIFTA look at that and see like, hey, maybe we could have done it ourselves to take care of the older adult population, not the general population. Let's just think about the older adult population. You know, what could DIFTA would have done if you had resources, right? Was there any kind of evaluation to really look at what happened? I know there was a lot of frustration in the beginning. So was there any kind of internal evaluation and say, hey, maybe we could have done better if we had this and that to support our providers, we could have handled it better for our seniors. Yes. I, I, so for, first, the pandemic isn't over, right? Um, we're, we're constantly assessing what's happening on the ground, how we're responding to it, and looking for opportunities to learn and continue to do better. So I would say that's very ingrained into the culture and fabric at DIFTA. Um, so, so you said a number of things um, in, in terms of HDM, you know, we're looking at demand. Um, as I said, there has been kind of that curve where there was really a spike and then we've seen a decrease. We continue to assess the, the situation and we're needed to engage OMB as our, as our partner to, to look at demand and how we as a city are serving it. Um, early on in the pandemic, I. I, I think everyone was very deeply frustrated. I'm, I'm not even sure what the perfect word is by the pandemic and um, how extraordinarily it, it changed the landscape so immediately. 
Um, I'm really proud of how DIFTA rolled out DIFTA Direct really rapidly to meet the needs of all of these older adult-centered participants and bring food directly to their home. Um, you're right that it transitioned to get food. And um, again, you know, we continue to work closely with them. They're still operational. And um, as they transition away uh, at some point, we'll work um, closely with them to make sure that older adults are supported through, um, you know, uh, food being the key um, item, whether it's in center or at home um, and be responsive to the needs of older adults. You know, and, and uh, when you testify, you talked about um, the cooling center, which we're very concerned about. And you said right now, um, over a hundred senior centers uh, have applied and 70 have been approved. Have all the HVACs problem at our older adult center been fixed? There were funding that was allocated uh, to fix um, HVAC system in the previous budget. So, um uh, there have there are a hundred it might it might even be slightly over that have been approved as cooling centers. There are at least seventy that are ready to go. They're cleaned. Um, if 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 and when we have a heat emergency, they'll be ready to open their doors. In terms of the HVAC repairs, um, uh, they for repairs at NYCHA senior centers. 14 sites are currently completed or in progress for repairs, and additional 14 are awaiting repairs. The status of each center and repair need is unique, and DIFTA continues to work closely with NYCHA as well as our providers mm -hmm. to ensure that repairs is made as quickly as possible with as little disruption to services as possible. You know, I mean, what I've, you know, heard back from providers, they probably will testify later too that oftentimes, you know, it's like we help get the, the word out. Wow, May 10th, you could grab and go is gonna start at your center, you know, June 14, the center's open. And then we find out a lot of them are not ready. You know, they say, oh, we have to clean out kitchen and we need this and that. So I just really wonder like what kind of, you know, support uh, the DIFTA provide and, and in, in the budget, I see like a $30 million accrual. Like, why wasn't that money given back to the senior centers to help them get ready? I mean, I, we knew that we were going to open the center soon because schools are open, restaurants are open. But like all of a sudden now we're all excited, you know, it's going to be open. And then, nope, they're not ready because they got to do this. They got to do that. <laughs> I mean, all of our seniors are very frustrated um, that even though yes, they could participate, continue with the virtual and the, and you know some outdoor activity, but I think that our you know older adult center they need that support. They need the support from DIFTA to really get get them ready quickly, so they can open back as soon as possible. Um, the other the other part is that we know that we advocated for. Uh, a budget of uh, $2 million for um, marketing to you know, get the word out about all the wonderful program. Uh, so I wanna make sure that that money also go to the centers themselves to help promote you know, the new program that they have available. I mean, during the pandemic, as you said earlier, the good thing is that a lot more senior uh, were able to get connected. So I think that is an opportunity for our older adult center to be able to utilize this funding to help them also to do marketing about what new services that they have. Um, so is there a plan for uh, DIFTA to allocate that money? Thank you. Um, so I, I believe that money and, and I can confirm and get back to you is included in the RFP. I, I will say in, in addition to, to that particular funding, um, we've 
also launched a number of campaigns. I think I'm sure you've seen um, the work we've done around the anti-ageism campaign, mm -hmm. something that I, I don't think DIFTA has ever done. Um, we've also, we have a campaign right now around caregiving, a campaign for friendly visiting, friendly voices. We've also done one um, on elder abuse and elder crime. So um, I think and hope what you're seeing from DEFTA is a, a really a clear commitment to get the word out, um, make older adults and their loved ones and caregivers aware of the robust offerings of Department for the Aging and, and make it um, clear and easy to, to get connected through no wrong door. That's, um... Yeah, I just we just want to make sure that I guess we can't talk about the RFP, but as you said, if, if the resources is there, um, that would be great. I just wanted to follow up on uh, what I mentioned earlier about the wait list uh, for home care. Uh, how's the working to get the 550 seniors who right now are on the wait list for uh, home care? Thank you. Um, so. You know, I, I personally don't love the phrase weightless. I understand that, but, but to reframe it a little bit, which I think is a lot more accurate, what we've seen during the pandemic is a surge in demand. So one of the surges in demand, and there are different um, flavors of this that we saw is a front door in case management, um, where a lot more people showed up. Um, and need a case management. And then I know you know, case management is a front door to home deliver meals and home care. Um, so nobody is just waiting. Case management is doing an initial intake with anybody who they're connecting with. They're assessing where they're at. If that client um, has any urgent or immediate need, it's being addressed. So for example, let's say the urgent and immediate need is food, then they're being connected to get food or a viable food resource to make sure we're being responsive and supportive. I mean, I'll also say our case management providers as part of their wellness calls and as part of how they approach their commitments to this work are regularly connecting with people on the wait list to make sure that they're okay and that nothing has changed and that there's nothing urgent coming up. So while, um, yes, there has been an increased demand for home care that we couldn't completely and fully respond to, um, it's not that clients are waiting, we're addressing urgent needs, we're staying in contact and we're supporting them um, and have been throughout the pandemic. Um, home care has also been, you know, uh, complicated and fluid during the pandemic in terms of, mm. you know, what clients need and what they want and, and even, you know, their comfort of bringing the, the home care attendant into the home. And while we saw, you know, a huge surge during the first six months of the pandemic, we're also really seeing a leveling off of demand as things return to some level of normal, say. And um, uh, to be specific, we, while we saw an increase in 36% of the clients early on to, in the pandemic, we're happy to report that we're now seeing a 48% decline in those waiting for home care services um, as we return to, again, some sense of normalcy. Okay, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Council Member Brooke Powers. I saw her hands raised. Council Member? Committee Council, can you uh, unmute Council Member Brooke Powell? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so first, thank you so much, Chair Chen, um, for holding today's um, hearing. I just wanted to also like raise some concerns once again about the uh, the DIFTA um, RFP that went out um, in terms of the mm -hmm. the senior homes. I had also conveyed some concerns in terms of that timeline. Um, because what we were hearing from the 
um, the senior centers was that there was not sufficient time, um, sufficient um, guidance on it. And so they felt um, left at a disadvantage. So I'm curious to know in terms of now that the RFP deadline has passed, um, what the submissions have been. Um, does the Department of Aging feel like they've received enough um, substantive um, submissions? Um, do they feel like there's still a gap there? And will there be an opportunity um, for this to go out again to, to give greater guidance and, and more time for other organizations to respond? Hi, sorry about that, I had to unmute. Um, so while I can't comment on the particulars, and thank you so much um, for your question about the responses to the RFP, I can say that they were thrilled by the enthusiastic response and the number of applications and submissions that we have received. And we'll circle back to you as soon as we can, what after um, awards are announced and, um, you know, we're past the, the review process. I'll also mention um, that, you know, this, this is, was such an important opportunity to move the landscape of older adult services into the future. And, and frankly, this, this was a need that was long overdue. And again, we're thrilled about the number of applications that we've seen. Clearly, there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm for the community. And we did um, extend the original deadline from the RFP, which was May 26 to June 11th. We also worked really closely with the Mayor's Office of Contract to monitor mayor's office of contracts to monitor all the applications to ensure that technology specifically the new passport system was not a barrier to anybody who wanted to apply and through this monitoring we um, extended the deadline and worked really closely with applicants and mocks to provide the technical assistance that, that was needed and this rfp is a significant increase in services for older adults for the first time in a decade. A further delay in the RFP would result in a delay to older adults having access to the, these increased and essential services. So thank you for that. I would be interested in seeing what the outcome is because to your point, I, I thought it was a very good RFP that would expand the services to your point. I just didn't do not want to see it where um, the community partners who have been doing the work and have expressed an interest have been a, unable to be com as competitive as they could be had they have been given a bit more time. I know there are some that submitted um, just to meet the deadline but did not feel like it was necessarily the strongest because of, again, the, the time constraints. Um, another question I have, I know that the, the city reopened or gave permission for senior centers to go ahead and open up. In my district um, in Southeast Queens and the Rockaways, I've found that many of ours have remained closed because they did not feel like they um, received the proper or sufficient, rather, guidance in terms of safely reopening um, their facilities. Some of them are doing the grab and goes, which is great. But in terms of like really um, having a, a strategic plan to reopen safely for mm -hmm. our seniors, um, I think that um, there could be a bit more support um, from the agency that I, mm -hmm. I would you know, love to partner um, with your agency to do to ensure that this is happening. Thank you, uh, Council Member Brooks Powers. Um, with all due respect, I, I don't think that's entirely fair. We worked with, very closely with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene to, to provide a, a pretty high level of specificity around what safe opening looks like right now. And in fact, even to differentiate, you know, what it looks like, for example, when you're eating a congregate meal versus 
for example, doing an outdoor painting class, which, which does have some similarities and some differences. We provided pretty detailed guidance to all of our providers um, because it was um, extensive and detailed and therefore potentially long. We also um, distilled this in uh, a quick guide chart format to make it easier and more digestible. We've also gone through this with the providers at meetings with, with different types of providers, including the commissioner engaging with providers in each of the boroughs and addressing their specific questions um, and program officers working directly with center or, or pro, you know, provider program staff um, to um, help them cull through some of this information and navigate. Councilmember Goodbrook Piles, we will, you know, share with you uh, when we get the briefing from DIFTA about uh, the RFP, um, number of applicants and, and all that information. But I, I do want to echo what Councilmember Power said, uh, Brooks Power said about centers not really getting um, all the support because like documents, you know, comes in and I know that I work with some of my centers to hear about what difficulties that they have, you know, depending on where their sites are, they have to get permission and they have to work with guidelines from the building owner. So they are a lot more, um, and it would have been better if they have gotten, you know, more support early on, you know, like, hey, we're preparing in the next three months we're gonna be opening and these are things that you have to start doing. And I think that the early preparation um, is key because why are you know, cleaning kitchens and, and, and getting the center ready? I mean, that should have been kind of done early and then also any kind of repair um, that needed to be done. It just seems like there's just so many, so much obstacle. And then a lot of center also lost staff. Because, because they're not providing certain services or cooking. And, and so now they have to like rehire staff or recall staff. So this, it takes a lot um, to get them ready and we wanna be helpful as much as possible. And then we also have to uh, tell our older adult population to be uh, patient and maybe they can you know, do more outdoor activity first um, and then and get the indoor activity started again. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, acknowledge that we've also been joined by council member Ayala. Um, there's one other question that I wanna follow up with you, Associate Commissioner, on is that the home sharing program. Uh, I mean, I have, Historic has a lot of interest in that program, but unfortunately that hasn't been that successful. Um, and from some of the statistics that we saw was that in FY20, only 10 matches was done. No, 22 matches in FY20 and only 10 in FY21 as of April. Uh, so what is the, what are some of the obstacles? I mean, I, and how do we help, you know, make a bigger impact? Because I, housing is such an important issue and we wanna make sure that seniors can be able to age in the community that, that they love. And if they have space and if we can, you know, help with the match. And we've heard uh, from providers that are saying some, you know, that not enough subsidy and the, the rent is not cheap. Uh, Cause I've seen, you know, some of the match um, that New York Foundation put out because we, we all help try to promote the program. I mean, it's not, I mean, it's not really for another low income seniors or uh, because they're, they're asking, you know, some of them are 800 or over a thousand. Uh, so I guess if you look at this program, what are some of the obstacles that you find? Why is the, the match is so low? Yeah, I'll come right back to that. I just wanted to um, touch really quickly on what we talked about before about the older adult center reopening and recognize, I, I hear your point about it. it would be ideal if we had um, three months prior to reopening given the guidance, but it was a very fluid situation and with the public health guidance really changing 
um, pretty frequently. And um, our POs have been contacting the programs every day. I, I also feel like, you know, we've gone through so many adaptations and this is another huge one, right? We, ha we had to move to virtual and now as we pivot back to reopening, as many of us pivot back to returning to the office, these are all adaptations with, with a lot of details that we're figuring out together. In terms of home sharing, yes, I agree with you. It's a great program. It's a great opportunity. Um, so to start with your question about cost, the program, I guess one of the pros and cons is it's it's limited, if you will, to, to the hosts that, that sign up for our program. And we're always, the, the key to success, one of the biggest keys to success with the program is bringing in more and more hosts. So I definitely um, ask everybody to help and support us as, as part of that mission. Um, New York Foundation does a really careful assessment of the hosts. Um, not only in terms of their living conditions and making sure that the, the home or apartment is safe and, um, and that the person, the host, um, is a good fit for a roommate sharing situation. Um, I, I don't know every rent, but I've seen a real range. And we do work really closely with New York Foundation to identify hosts across the city. Again, we could always do more, you know, in partnership with everybody um, to bring more hosts in. But there's certainly, I mean, New York, you know, sometimes has high rents. So it really has to do with the hosts that come in and what the rent is in that particular housing unit. Um, the, we've done a lot to partnerships with DYCD. The, the provider has done a lot in terms of appearing on talk shows and doing some really great and beautiful highlights of some of the wonderful matches that they've made, some um, really compelling material. Um, yes, it, it was definitely disrupted during COVID. Um, it was one of the few programs that was pretty hard to pivot um, when we're asking older adults to stay at home, I'm really mindful, I, I, you know, at the highest level of preserving and maintaining public safety about introducing to strangers, this is before vaccination was available and so on, um, having them come into a, a, a home together. So um, I definitely agree um, that during COVID that there were some struggles with this program. And um, as we move towards vaccination, I'm certainly hopeful that we'll work with them and with you um, to increase the number of matches. Yeah, I, I think that is, um, you know, some of it is really the, the issue of providing some subsidies um, for the rent because um, the rent, you know, especially in Manhattan is very high. Uh, so that is, if we wanted to, make sure that we, this program is successful, we really do have to, to look at that. I just wanna go back to the, the issue about the center reopening. I mean, like, yeah, we've been asking about reopening since last September. I mean, we hear the schools reopening, restaurants reopening, and senior centers are not reopening. And that's why, you know, we're saying that, look, there should have been a plan in place. And so terms of like, what are some of the, and we know what are some of the, the, the health um, needs are and, and guidelines are. And so to really, you know, give the center more time to prepare, to get things fixed and to get the support that they need, the funding they need, uh, whether they need to ch change the HVAC system or, you know, clean out their kitchen and, and all that could have been done much, much earlier. And I just think that, you know, the, the city needs to kind of really take a serious look at that in terms of, having a plan in place. I mean, that's what my, my colleague had to pass legislation to talk about even a plan for um, vaccine for our homebound seniors. And that took a, a long time and we still haven't really seen a plan. And so I think learning from what happened during the pandemic and learning about, you know, really having enough time to prepare with information. I mean, that's why there was like all these frustration because we said, Schools are reopening, restaurants are reopening, and our senior centers are so close. And, you know, and that's why we say, wait a minute, where's the plan? You know, why, why, why not? Why not the senior center reopening? 
And so I think that that's something that we need to, that definitely to really um, take a look at and see how, you know, planning needs to be in place so that we can, you know, we can meet the needs of our older populations. And that's where, you know, that's where the frustration was. Because every call we got was, you know, when is our centers going to be reopening? And all my colleagues were inundated. And I was getting called from my, from council member, like, what's going on? Why, how, when's the centers going to be reopened? Um, so that's where the, you know, the frustration is. We've been asking since last year. Um, Understood. So. I, I, and we've been so eager yeah. to reopen, which I think you know. Um, and, and we have been planning and, you know, we've had to, to work and, and lockstep um, informed and guided by the public health guidance, which has been really Yeah, we realize that. But also, I think with in terms of, you know, funding support, you know, for the senior, when I see a $30 million accrual on the DIFTAS budget, it's kind of like, I want to make sure that money goes back, you know, to our providers and that get lost, um, you know in the whole budget scheme. And I just wanna make sure that they have the support so that they can reopen successfully following all the guidelines and, and to be able to do that. Uh, and I hope that, you know, most of the centers will be reopened soon uh, for the summer, especially during the heat season that, that you know, there'll be like cooling center, HVAC systems are working. And I know that we're looking forward, you know, to this RFP. Uh, we know that a lot of people have a lot of organizations apply. And our job is to make sure there's sufficient funding uh, for this community care plan that the commissioner has, you know, advocated so much for. And we are supportive, but we just want to make sure that there is enough funding going forward um, to make sure that there is successful. And also, my last question is that once the RFP is out, I mean, done, there are going to be centers who might not have gotten funding. To still to have a transition plan in place, just in case if some of these centers that did not get funded have to close, are there like plan in place in terms of transportation or make sure that no senior gets lost in the crowd? That if their senior center happened not to be funded, they got to go somewhere else. How do we make sure that they still will be able to access um, a center close to them or? make sure that they're taken care of. If there is a transition of providers, which is possible, obviously, we don't know, um, DIFTA will work closely with both providers to ensure that um, to the fullest extent possible, there is no lapse in service. And, and also, um, I, I really want to reassure you that providers will get the funding they need to support um, the services they've been providing and that we're working with them to spend their budgets. You're talking about the reopening. <laughs> yes, and, and, and about the accrual comment. Um, okay. Shared, yes. Yes, we don't want to lose any funding, okay? <laughs> I want to make sure that money goes stays within DIFTA and given back to the providers. I right? making sure I don't want to lose a dime. Because this year our goal is that we gotta get over that half a percent mark. Right? I mean it's a shame that the DIFTA's budget is less than half a percent of the city's budget. So we're aiming for at least five hundred million. And that's what um, Commissioner and I we're working together on. So to make sure that DIFTA's budget is in firm, strong hands, strong faces going forward. So I just wanna thank you and uh, for coming to testify today on primary day. And, uh, and we're gonna take testimony from the public. So thank you again, Social Commissioner. Thank you so much, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I give my regard to the commissioner, I miss her. <laughs> I will let her today. know. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Take care. Yeah. Committee Council, I pass it back to you. Thank you. We will now turn to public testimony. Once more, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise, Zoom, raise hand function in Zoom, and you will be called on after each panel has completed their testimony. 
For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin after setting the timer. All testimony will be limited to three minutes. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. The first panel will be Tara Klein from United Neighborhood Houses, Kevin Jones from AARP, Rhonda Soberman from Visiting Service Nurse Service of New York, and Dorothy Jang from the Asian American Federation. Tara Klein, you may begin when ready. Starting time. Thank you, and thank you, Chair Chen, for all of your fierce advocacy for older adults and to the committee for being part of this great hearing today. Uh, my name is Tara Klein. I'm a senior policy analyst with United Neighborhood Houses. UNH is a policy and social change organization that represents 40 neighborhood settlement houses in New York City. As you know, settlement houses have acted really phenomenally on the front lines to meet older adults' emergency needs throughout the pandemic providing them with food, financial benefits, mental health supports, virtual activities, and COVID testing and vaccinations. On top of this laudable work, over the last several months, providers have prepared applications for the Older Adult Centers and NORC RFP, as well as plan to reopen centers to in-person activities. Now, as we enter a new phase in pandemic recovery with in-person activities resuming, it's critical that we look to some lessons learned in order to strengthen the aging services network. So first, as uh, Chair Chen, you just touched on, we need to ensure that there is contract transition plans and service continuity plans. New contracts are slated to begin on October 1st. We have actually heard some rough numbers that indicate there have been many more applications than contracts that are available under this RFP, and I'd be happy to follow up about that offline. Uh, given this, it's likely that there are going to be some new centers and that some existing centers may lose contracts. We need transition plans in place. This includes community outreach and transportation plans for older adults if their centers are closing. And for new centers, they need time to hire staff, purchase equipment, and promote centers to the neighborhood. If necessary, DIFTA should consider delaying the contract start dates to allow for this type of planning. And we hope the council will monitor the status of the RFP and speak up if there is a delay warranted. Next and related, uh, we need to provide FY22 council funding for senior centers and NORCs. The community care plan is going to bring some really great new investments in to allow senior centers and NORCs to expand and enhance services. However, it's unlikely that this funding is going to cover all existing needs, including NORC nursing hours that the council previously covered. Most importantly, the council needs to fund the senior centers and NORCs that it currently supports for at least July through September 2021 until new contracts are scheduled to begin. It must also have a funding plan in place for these centers in case contracts do begin later than October 1st. And finally, the council must consider supporting centers that may lose their DIFTA contracts to ensure older adults do not lose access to their services. Uh, while there's still a lot of uncertainty about what RFP awards will look like, we urge the council to set aside adequate funding to ensure a smooth transition to new contracts. And then finally for today, even with the community care plan investments, DIFTA's budget, as you know, remains less than one half of 1% of the city's overall budget. In the final days of the budget negotiations, we remind the council to take on our action for aging budget recommendations. These include $16.6 million oh, for the home delivered meals program. This is still a very strong need for this traditional HDM program. $48 million for a 3% cost of living adjustment to support the full human services sector, as well as council discretionary funding to meet new and growing needs, including restoring cuts from last year, supporting the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative, which is a DOHMH council initiative separate from the Thrive Program, technology needs for older adults, and restoring the full NORC initiative. Uh, there are more details in my written testimony. I'm happy to answer questions as well. So thank you very much. And happy election day. Thank you, Tara. We will now hear from Kevin Jones. Starting the time. Great. Good morning, Chair Chen and members of the Committee on Aging. My name is Kevin Jones. I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy at AARP New York, representing 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. Um, so thank you for hearing from us today. The COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on the lives and well-being of more than 1.7 million 
60 plus um, uh, adults in New York City, of whom 136,000 ho are homebound and nearly 20% are living below the federal poverty line. Over the course of the past year, COVID-19 has ca caused significant disruptions to a wide array of critical services for both homebound seniors and New Yorkers aging in their homes and or living in Norks. In AARP's uh, Disrupt Disparities 3.0 report, we found that at the height of the pandemic in New York, home health agencies and uh, in the city and across the state struggled to provide continued care to seniors as a result of uh, significant staffing and PPE shortages. A large portion of older adults who are not homebound and or do not require caretaking services also reported that they struggled to access primary care in person out of fears that they would contract, uh, contract COVID-19 and did not have sufficient access to telemedicine due to technology, uh, technological limitations, excuse me. <clears throat> Older New Yorkers and communities across the city also experienced high rates of food insecurity and social isolation, in part due to the closure of senior centers and in-person social services. While the city established Get Food NYC to help meet this, meet this demand, AARP heard numerous accounts of how uh, some of these meals were pre uh, prepared were not nutritionally or culturally appropriate for the older adults that were receiving them. Without the ability to attend in-person programming and social activities offered by senior centers, older New Yorkers also suffered from higher rates of social isolation over the course of the past year, especially those who were unable to participate in virtual programmings due to technological limitations. Many of these issues were only compounded for NYCHA senior residents due to a myriad of infrastructure issues that have plagued NYCHA for years, as well as the temporary shutdown of NYCHA senior centers. While NYCHA tenants have suffered from unsafe and substandard housing conditions for years, such as chronic elevator outages and broken air ventilation systems, these issues had an immense impact on the well being of NYCHA senior residents amid COVID 19. As the city begins to reopen and recover from COVID-19, AARP re recommends that the city takes a series of steps in order to ensure that the city's older adults receive the quality care and services that ensure their health and well-being moving forward. We recommend the mayor's recent commitment. Uh, uh, we commend, excuse me, the mayor's recent commitment to invest 58 million into the five-year community care plan for older New Yorkers. However, we believe that the city council should restore pre-pandemic funding for key initiatives, including NORCs the Geriatric Mental Health Initiative, the Healthy Aging Initiative, um, all in the FY22 budget in order to further support the uh, health of our city's older adults in the months ahead. While we believe the reopening of senior centers will be a significant step in addressing the issues that have affected the overall well-being of New Yorkers, especially in food insecurity and social isolation, it will remain critical Not for the city smart. to ensure that the older adults continue to have uh, access access to quality home delivered meals. So we advocate for uh, the city setting aside 16.6 million in funding for home delivered meals, as well as investing uh, in uh, reducing the digital divide. Um, there are more details in my written testimony, but I'm happy to take questions and thank you for your time. Thank you. We will now hear from Rhonda Soberman. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Chin and members of the Committee on Aging. My name is Rhonda Silverman. I'm Manager of Program Development for the Visiting Nurse Service of New York. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk about the NSMY's NORC nursing program. We support 30 NORCs in 22 council districts throughout the city. Our nurses have provided more than 12,000 hours of NORC nursing services in fiscal year 2021. We're advocating for inclusion of these critical nursing services in the fiscal year 2022 budget. Since the COVID-19 pandemic began in March, 2020, the NSMY has cared for more than 6,500 COVID positive New Yorkers in their home. We have also vaccinated thousands of frontline staff and homebound New Yorkers. You have our written testimony today with highlights of our long-term commitment to the NORC model. So let me focus a little bit on our work during the pandemic. Our goal throughout the pandemic has been to help seniors, especially those suffering from chronic health conditions, avoid unnecessary ER visits and hospitalizations. Early on, our Newark nurses quickly transitioned in per to, from in-person to telephonic services. We linked seniors in need to the medical care that they required and advocated for them when their doctors and other healthcare provider offices were closed or operating under reduced hours. We supported and empowered seniors to utilize the education our Newark nurses provided pre-pandemic to help them best manage their health condition. 
As concerns and misinformation grew about COVID-19, our nurses, in coordination with our social service partners, sponsored events and distributed factual information to dispel myths and educate residents on practical ways to stay healthy and address their health concern. Once the vaccine became available, seniors received important education about the vaccine from their trusted North nurse, who was available to speak with them individually if needed to reduce, reduce their anxiety and particular concerns about getting vaccinated. It is essential that we maintain and sustain these critical nursing supports. Continued council funding will address some of the potential issues related to the recently released Community Care Plan RFP. These concerns include gap funding. Since the RFP won't be awarded until several months into fiscal year 2022, there'll be a gap in funding for currently provided NORC nursing services, resulting in no services at all. Also, level of nursing services. Approximately 50% of the current NORC programs requested less hours of their consistent NORC nursing services for their RFP application, which may indicate an inability to finance current nursing hours within their budget. And also needed support for programs that didn't qualify for the RFP or who aren't granted an award, but still provide services to our most vulnerable seniors. They will be unable to sustain nursing services in their community without city council support. NORCs are the natural outgrowth of the longstanding commitment the city council and DIFTA have demonstrated to I help our fine. seniors live and thrive in the communities they call home. NORC nursing services help seniors age in place long before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and now we urge the council to continue this really important investment as the NORC program expands. Thank you so much for all you have done and all you do, Chair Chin and the council. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Rhonda. We will now hear from Dorothy Jang. Starting time. I want to thank the Committee on Aging for holding this hearing and giving the Asian American Federation, AF, the opportunity to testify about the needs of our senior community and senior service providers. I'm Dorothy Jiang, Membership and Capacity Building Coordinator at AF. We represent the collective voice of more than 70 member nonprofits serving 1.3 million Asian New Yorkers. We're here because 13% of the city's senior population are Asian. One in four Asian New Yorkers lives in poverty, and 72% of Asian seniors have limited English proficiency, LAP. Our seniors comprise more than two thirds of the senior population in many neighborhoods across Brooklyn and Queens. Before the pandemic, our seniors went to senior centers for social activities, congregate meals, assistance applying for social services, and health and mental health services. Now, many seniors are still too afraid to leave their homes to go to senior centers. So they need at-home services that meet their needs. At the same time, however, one in four LEP Asian seniors in the city does not have internet access at home. While the reopening of senior centers is a cause for connection and celebration, our seniors and senior serving organizations face additional crises. Our seniors face anti-Asian violence, which leaves seniors terrified to leave their homes. Our seniors are physically isolated with fewer resources. Many live alone and are anxious about accessing the public benefits they need. Our seniors are digitally isolated. Many don't have smartphones or computers, and if they do, they don't have in-language support to learn how to use them. Our senior serving member agencies are working beyond capacity to serve seniors as efficiently and safely as possible. From May to November alone, AAF helped six senior serving organizations to serve almost 3,000 seniors with nearly 20,000 food services and 8,500 assurance calls. Our own Hope Against Hate campaign is working toward immediate safety for Asian New Yorkers with safety ambassador programs and multilingual victim support services. As we navigate the reopening of our senior centers, our cities must do better to support our organizations. Our members need clarity on reopening. The city must give greater weight to organizations with a demonstrated track record of serving low income immigrant communities with linguistic and cultural competency. Our CBOs are leading by example in the provision of direct services and they're instrumental in restoring trust between our most vulnerable populations and the city. Here are recommendations. One, give more thorough guidance on reopening protocols and assistance so CBOs can transition smoothly to in-person services. Two, fund CBOs to tackle seniors' main areas of need, food and nutrition, technology access and usage support, language support, and mental health and social isolation. Three, 
Fund AAF's Hope Against Hate campaign with $10 million in new initiative funding so we can provide community-centered solutions our seniors have asked for. Four, fund the full implementation of Local Law 30 across city agencies so our seniors have access to quality translation when and where they need it. Thank you so much for allowing us at Asian American Federation to testify, and we look forward to working Tanya's with all of you. Part. Let's make sure our senior communities get the support they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. We will next hear from Brianna Payden Williams from Live on New York. Brianna, you may begin when ready. Starting time. Hello. Um, I'm Brianna Peter Williams, the Communications and Policy Associate at Live On New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live On New York's members include more than 100 community-based nonprofits that provide core services that allow all New Yorkers to thrive in our community as we age. With our city on the road to recovery, we are presented with the opportunity to re-envision how we serve older adults in senior residences and through our community. The COVID-19 pandemic uncovered the growing need for aging services, as well as shined a light on the visible inequities in supporting all New Yorkers as we age. While New Yorkers have heard of the stark and heart-wrenching realities that took place in nursing homes during the pandemic, the experiences of independent senior residences have been less explored to date. While loss was a reality across New York, HUD's 202s and senior affordable rental assistant buildings fared significantly better than what might have feared. The challenges in these relative, excuse me, the challenges in this relative success were significant as providers were not only worried about safety, but of ensuring older adults remain fed and avoided social isolation. The stars in confronting these challenges were not only the nonprofits that stepped up to connect older adults with the city's emergency feeding programs, but the service coordinators who remained a lifeline for tenants throughout the pandemic. It wouldn't be an, an exaggeration to say that the availability of service coordinators and buildings saved lives during the pandemic. Unfortunately, not all senior residences can afford to hire service coordinators or the staff to build or the staff the building to the extent that would be ideal. As the city looks to become a leader, a, a leader in public health, creating a fund, a fund for senior residences to hire service coordinators to assist older adults in the enhanced needs that come with aging in place is the proven first step in that direction. Further, as the population ages, it is critical that increasing investments are made by the city to meet the demand to combat this crisis level shortage of housing services, of housing supply, excuse me. While strides have been made, particularly with the reopening of senior centers, there's still more to be done. For years, DIPTA remains critically underserved and under-resourced, receiving less than half of 1% of the overall city budget in contrast to the rapidly increasing older adult population. New York City is entering a critical phase of recovery. As we progress forward in building a New York for all ages, the city must continue to show its commitment to older adults with critical investments in senior services. And this includes restoring all city council aging discretionary funding to FY20 levels, use 21 accruals to cover costs associated with reopening in-person senior services, as well as 30 million for HVAC repairs, safety precautions, and senior center upgrades, as well as we're asking for 48 million for a cost of living adjustment for essential human service workers, as well as 16.6 million for home delivered meals. And that is everything. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Brianna. Finally, we will be hearing from Melissa Scars from SAGE. Melissa? Starting time. Great. Well, um, so on behalf of SAGE, thank you to the City Council and Chair Chin for holding this hearing on serving cities, elders, and residences and community in the midst of pandemic. My name is Melissa Sklars. I'm Government Relations Strategist at SAGE. SAGE is the uh, first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT elders. Uh, SAGE has been a cornerstone for the LGBT community, providing vital services to elders and older people for over 43 years. The urgency of SAGE's response to the pandemic stems from the reality that elders and older people living with HIV are at the epicenter of the pandemic. There are higher levels of underlying health conditions like HIV and diabetes, higher levels of poverty, food and housing security, lower access to healthcare and supportive services, social isolation, and thin support networks. 
The cessation of in-person services and programs has made access to technology critical, if not life-saving. Um, throughout the pandemic, SAGE continues to be the LGBT elders lifeline. Many elders depend upon SAGE for assistance uh, for essentials like food and access to medical support. As LGBT elders sheltered in place, food insecurity, social isolation became threats. Many turned to SAGE for connection and community. Uh, through our social and educational programs. We have uh, launched new programs during the pandemic. Uh, we've connected our people to Get Food NYC. We have more than 100 support groups, classes, and activities at the virtual SAGE Center. We have provided compassionate phone-based support to thousands of elders every week. We've continued with virtual uh, telephone meetings, support groups, services, and programs. We have also opened in, in the past year and a half uh, New York State's first LGBT welcome, welcoming affordable elder housing, first Stonewall House in Brooklyn, and now Cortona Pride House in the Bronx. Uh, Stonewall House was opened in 2019. It's in Fort Green, Brooklyn, 140 new residents. Uh, we were able to open and, and support people during the pandemic. Uh, stage staff has been on site from the beginning to conduct wellness checks door to door, deliver groceries and coordinate care. This past January, we opened Cretona Pride House with 83 units in East Tremont, Bronx. Uh, we've been moving in tenants who offer affordable uh, housing to predominantly low income older adults of color. Uh, soon we'll be opening our SAGE centers in both ground floors providing services to the residents and for residents of both neighbors in the Bronx and in Brooklyn. Finally, the pandemic has showed our city how critical it is to care for older New Yorkers. Poor communities, those living at the intersection of oppressed identities, those with chronic health conditions and isolated people have and continue to bear the brunt of this catastrophic illness. LGBT elders are among those most at risk as our city continues to navigate the challenges posed by the pandemic, we must prioritize adequately resourcing programs and services for older people in our city's elder resources. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your testimony, Melissa. Now I will turn it back to Chair Chen for any questions and comments. Thank you. Um, I really want to thank all of you for coming to testify, but also really from the bottom of my heart to thank all of you uh, for your hard work for our older adult population during the pandemic and in regular good times too. That it's it's been difficult this past year, but you know the advocacy uh, you know of um, all of you and especially our providers. I just want to make sure. Uh, to reassure you that we will fight very hard um, in the council to make sure that we increase the budget and restore funding that was cut. Um, but I also urge you to tell your um, centers and your constituents to also contact all the council members um, in their district to give us the backup, give us the support, uh, especially council member who are on the budget negotiation team. My intention is I will not let $1 slip from the senior's budget. I mean, our hope is to fight for more, okay? Not less. Uh, and what I talked about earlier to get over that half of 1%, I really, you know, really mean it. I mean, it's a shame that the budget is so small and the aging population is growing. And your recommendations and, and your services means a lot. Um, you know, Tara, thank you. Um, you know, for your uh, United, you know, neighborhood, for your advocacy and, and really letting us, reminding us that we need to plan and the transition plan makes sense because there are going to be centers who are not going to get funded. Uh, who's going to lose their funding because of the RFP. And we just want to make sure that the seniors don't lose their services. So we will, you know, make sure that we have a, we'll push DIFTA for a transitional plan, but at the same time in the city council, we will make sure that we have funding there to help with that. Um, and Rona, you know, thank you for visiting nurse uh, and you know, all the work that you've done during the pandemic. Uh, I know that the 
nursing service is so critical. Um, and we were not sure that it was even included in the RFP. And so that's why we're gonna make sure that we don't lose that funding from the city council. That it's gotta uh, stay there and this opportunity to increase, we will. Uh, because I think one of the North, the North program, one of the things that we've been successful in the council is creating new North program. A lot of my colleagues are very interested in creating new North. And some of them might not have been ready to apply for this RFP, but the council, we have, you know, have a good track record of promoting and developing new NORCs and new older adult senior center for immigrant population. I hope that some of those 10 centers will be um, successful in getting into the RFP. Uh, if not, we will look ways to continue to support them and to increase the number because we need know that the needs is great. Um, there are a lot more seniors out there that have not been connected to our centers and senior services. So even though I am you know, really uh, grateful that the mayor and the commissioner have put forth the community collab care plan, uh, when I first look at it, I say, not enough, not enough money, uh, not enough centers and milk that's gonna be created. But uh, I really um, you know, thank you for all your advocacy and really look forward uh, with you in this next few days, uh, it's going to be critical. So get your constituent to call those council members because we have PNT tomorrow and Thursday. And uh, as much backup as, as we can, I know that we have some really strong council member on our side. And we just want to make sure that we get the reinforcement when we fight for that budget. So let's get it over that half of 1%. All right. Let's work together and make that sure that we can do that this year and to make it this year truly the year of the seniors and older adults and i thank you again for all for coming you know to the hearing on primary day go out there and vote and get the constituents to vote and thank you to our committee council uh Yusan, and also to our sergeant uh for supporting supporting our hearing today um any other comments or uh, no, if we have inadvertently missed anyone that would still like to testify, uh, please use the Zoom raise hand function at this time, and we will call you on the in the order that your hand is raised. Seeing none, we have concluded the public testimony. So, Chair Chin, it's for you to close. Thank you. So, thank you again for being here today, and thank you to all my colleagues and uh, and everyone. Let's go out and vote. And the hearing of the Committee on Aging is now adjourned.